Texas Crossroads Chapter 4 Part 2 Whatever disappointment Governor Cadoro felt about the results of Bastrop's troop mission could not have measurably added to the distress he already suffered. In 1805, U.S. troops had arrived in the vicinity of the Natchitoches and asserted U.S. claims to the area. By early 1806, both sides were convinced that the other was preparing for war. In March, President Jefferson reported to the U.S. Congress some time since, however, we learned that the Spanish authorities were advancing into the disputed country to occupy new posts and make new settlements. Jefferson responded by ordering U.S. troops to chase out the Spanish detachment that Governor Cadoro had ordered to occupy the Los Ares district in response to which the Texas governor ordered the militia to reinforce Nagadoches. To defuse the situation, Commandment General Nemechio Salcido proposed establishing a neutral ground between Nacho Nachotes and the Sabine River, while the boundary between United States and Spanish territory was negotiated. To these developments were added the complications of the Aaron Burr conspiracy and U.S. reconnaissance of the Red River country. Dissatisfied with this, with his prospects in the United States, Burr, what the vi volatile former vice president, developed a scheme with a number of associates to separate the trans Appalachian states from the Union and combine them with the Louisiana Purchase and the silver mining region of northern New Spain into a great empire. As soon as rumors of Burr's scheme reached Salcedo, he advised Cordero. It is a very grave matter that some 10,000 men subject, subjects of the United States are being prepared in Kentucky with the object of overpowering the uninhabited provinces of this kingdom and our Indian allies with no respect for the boundaries of Louisiana. You will therefore take extraordinary precautions to toward putting the country in a good state of defense by bringing up all the auxiliaries. The commandment general's response to another incident was even more confront confrontational. In the spring of 1806, an exploratory expedition under Major Thomas Freeman began to ascend the Red River. When he received the news of the, this obvious violation of Spanish territory, Commandment General Salcedo issued orders to stop the expedition. In continuing westward, Freeman had managed to travel 600 miles up the Red River before he was confronted by a large Spanish detachment and decided to turn back. Throughout these months, the Spanish had been reinforcing the small Texas garrisons with auxiliary units from other provinces. First to arrive was a light cavalry unit from Cohia, known as the Second Flying Company of San Carlos del Alam Alamo de Paris. The unit arrived in Baxter in 1803 and occupied the abandoned buildings of Missions San Anto of Mission San Antonio de Valero, lending its name to the site which would never ever after be known as the Alamo. Militia units from Nueva Santander and Nueva Leon Brought, troot, brought total troop strength in the province to over 1,000 by early summer. Despite growing war hysteria along the U.S. frontier and the troop building on the Texas side, cooler heads prevailed. Wilkinson arrived unopposed at the Sabine River on October 29th and immediately sent a message to the Texas governor proposing an agreement by which the Spaniards would not recross the Sabine and the Americans would retreat to Natchitoches and not recross the Rajo Hondo until the boundary had finally been negotiated. While Cadoro hesitated, Lieutenant Colonel Simon Herrera seized the moment and on his own authority accepted Wilkinson's terms. 
on November 5th, 1806, at the U.S. Army camp on the Sabine, General Wilkinson and Inspector Francisco Viana signed what came to be called the Neutral Ground Agreement. Cordero could now turn his attention to preparing the rest of Texas for what he was sure would be an inevitable onslaught of Anglo-Americans. Fortress Texas reinforcing against the American threat. Governor Cadoro and his superiors knew that troops alone could not hold the province, defending the Texas frontier of New Spain from the land-hungry Anglo-Americans would depend on increasing the population. The, the time seemed pro propitious for a con concerted population drive as Spanish subjects in Louisiana deserted what is now what was now U.S. territory and relative peace reigned most of Texas indigenous peoples and their Spanish colonial neighbors between 1805 and the outbreak of the Mexican War of Independence in 1810. There was reason for hope for among the long-suffering Tejanos that this might be their day in the sun. Antonio Cordero y Bustamante had been thrown into a difficult situation, but this was not the first time in his long and successful career as a frontier officer. Born in Cadiz, Spain in 1753, he had come to New Spain as a cadet and soon found himself fighting Indians in the, on the northern frontier. He distinguished himself in campaigns against various western Apache tribes before being assigned to the Cahia Theater of Action in 1795. Throughout this time, he strengthened Presidio defenses and organized new settlements, activities at that he continued after becoming governor of Cohia in 1798. Commandment General Nemigio Salcedo turned to the popular Cordero in the summer 1805 to assume the reins of command in Texas. It would be up to Cordero to make sense of the increasingly chaotic situation. Challenges and opportunities for the development of Texas the interim governor could see that there was much work to do in Texas. Formal settlement remained confined to San Antonio de Bexer, to, I'm sorry, de Be Bejer, the capital of the province. The Presidio Mission Complex of La Bahia del Espirito Santo and the villages of Nagadoches of, the, of these popular population centers base Behar was by far the largest containing over 2,000 men, women, and children, the other two having roughly 900 Tejanos each. Also during the 1790s, an informal settlement of 100 to 200 persons, at least some of whom were involved in contraband trade, had begun to form at the Bayou Payer in the old Las Ares district. In addition, in 1803, the Alamo Company added considerably to the military population of the province and put Cordero's available fighting strength at about 350 soldiers when he arrived in Texas. Cordero also inherited the difficult problem of Louisiana immigrants. The Baron of Bastrop was not the only Louisiana subject of his Catholic majesty. majesty who sought to start a new life in Spanish Texas. A number of individuals and families petitioned for Texas land. Commandment General Salcedo, suspicious as the, a result of the U.S. claim that Texas was part of the Louisiana Territory, allowed the settlement of people who could prove their loyalty to the crown. Cordero absolutely forbid the omission of Anglo-Americans as they seemed intent on undermining Spanish-Indian relations on the frontier. As for the Indian peoples in Texas, Governor Cordero might perceive continued challenges to Spanish sovereignty in some but opportunities in others. Some groups were in decline and facing extinction. Others were expanding and there were opportunities for new arrivals. By the early 19th century, 
many Coheltican bands had died out completely as separate culture groups. A similar trend was evident among the elusive Tonkawas of Central Texas, who at several hundred tribe members were at least holding out better than the Bidai and Akokisa, who numbered no more than 100 or 200. The Caddo speakers of East Texas also ha had also experienced drastic drops in numbers, most tribes consisting of no more than a few hundred individuals. Many villages had been aban abandoned and their surviving members had moved in with Caddo relatives on the Louisiana side of the frontier. Even in their declining numbers, these groups still posed challenges to Spanish governance. Although Cordero had even bigger Indian concerns, for Cordero, the Indians requiring serious attention were the various Apache, Wichita, and Comanche tribes that still ranged freely on the western periphery, peripheries of Spanish Texas that combined pressure of Comanches and Norteños on the Apaches had forced the Lipans southward until by the end of the 18th century, they inhabited a territory south of San Antonio and stretching into northern Cohia. Their Muscaleros and Lipans made peace with each other and finally with Spanish colonials whose main complaints continued to be a loss of livestock to young raiding warriors. More formidable were the Comanches and Wichitas their commercial contacts with Louisiana and New Mexico, their large numbers and their dominance of the Southern Plains required Spanish officials to deal with them as equals. Governor Cordero continued this successful policy of peace by purchase, but facing, faced a new challenge in Anglo-American tradesmen who moved onto Southern Plains in an effort to gain the friendship, economic and political of these people Numbering in the thousands, mobile and militarized, they represented, uh, represented autonomous societies that believed Spain's assertion of complete sovereignty in the region. Another type of Indian challenge developed at this time in the form of Im immigrant tribes from U.S. territory, which for Cadero may well have represented an opportunity to strengthen the border. Spain's rivalry with the United States made Texas an attractive destination for groups seeking to escape Anglo-American control. Small bands of Indians form a number of tribes began making their way into Spanish territory during the 1790s, particularly in the eastern part of the province where the decline of the indigenous communities had left considerable amount of land suitable for settlement. Among the immigrant tribes that Cordero had to deal with during his service in Texas were bands of Alabama, Apaches, Biloxis, Coshatas, Pascagoulis, and Shawnees. Welcoming such groups, di which did not represent a menace to the Tejano population, might help stabilize the border situation in Spain's favor. Defensive colonization. Under the circumstance, there was no doubt that Texas also needed reinforcing with Hispanic settlers, and Cordero concluded that settlement should con concentrate on the Camino Real between Nocodoches and San Antonio. Occupation of strategic sites along the road would ex ex expedite communications within the province and make it easier for the new settlers to transport their goods. By the end of the end of September 1805, Governor Cadero was requesting permission to found towns on the Trinity and Brazos River, rivers with a mix of native Tejanos and Louisiana immigrants in December 1805. Five families from Bexar that had been recruited for the project were on their way to the Trinity, where they discovered a group of Louisiana immigrants waiting for them. Early in 1806, they found the town of Santa Sima Trinidad del Salcedo, most often referred to as Salcedo, under the supervision of a military officer from Bixer. By late January, titles to house lots and agricultural land were being issued, and construction began 
on a number of buildings. So successful was this first settlement effort under Cordero that families from Nacogdoches petitioned for permission to relocate to the new town. Despite Salcedo's approval of Cordero's initial settlement plan, the two men did not see eye to eye on how best to utilize the growing pool of immigrants. In particular, Cordero saw the Louisiana Louisianans, who, many of whom wished to remain in Nagadoches area. As the only means to populate East Texas in the absence of any significant migration from the interior of New Spain, this was especially important as the Tejano population of that part of the province was unable to supply provisions to the growing number of troops. Salcedo concerned about the ever-present present contraband problem and suspicious of the loyalties of many new of the new arrivals refused to allow them to, to locate permanently east of the Trinity. His superior, having made clear his hard line on settlement in the Nagadoches region, Governor Cordero turned his attention to promoting new settlements further farther west. He now requested permission to found towns on the Colorado, Guadalupe, and San Marcos crossings in the Camino Real, a request that was granted by the Commandment General, the first and only one of the three towns that was actually established was San Marcos de Nueve. Cordero worked out a deal with Felipe Roque de la Portilla, a fellow army officer from Spain who had been in service in the Nuevo Santander in return for a large grant, land grant and sizable subvention to the families he recruited. Portilla gathered a group of followers and a substantial number of animals and brought them to the San Marcos in April of 1808. Of the five authorized settlements in Texas, only Salcedo and San Marcos were established, un unlike Salcedo, which was made up of the Bejigna and Louisianans. San Marcos was settled mostly by families from below the Rio Grande, whereas Salcedo enjoyed military protection from the beginning. San Marcos had no garrison and was therefore exposed to Indian depredations. Salcedo enjoyed modest growth until his its abandonment. But San Marcos <clears throat> attracted no new settlers after the first few months, but ultimately suffered the same fate, however falling victim to the warfare that engulfed Texas during the Mexican War of Independence and being completely abandoned by the fall of 1813. Lost efforts at reform. In the summer of 1808, much of to Cordero's relief, his replacement arrived. The new governor turned out to be none other than the Nemenzo Salcedo's two, 32 year old nephew, Manuel Maria de la Concepcion, Josef Agustin Eloy de Salcedo y Quirga. Despite his young age, Manuel came with considerable experience. He had assisted his father who had served as the last Spanish governor of Louisiana. To assume his post, Manuel Sosero and his family had traveled by way of the United States, landing at New Bedford, Massachusetts, going on to New York City, then to Philadelphia and F Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Riverboat travel down the Ohio and Mississippi rivers brought them to the Natchez. From there, they traveled by coach to Nachotes. <clears throat> in Nachotes, Salcedo met with U the U.S. government officials before proceeding to the Nacogdoches, where he arrived in early October 1808. By the time he reached the Texas capital at Big Sur by at the end of the month, Salcedo must have been fully aware of the con challenges that confronted him. Manuel Salcedo took over the most exposed province of a colony under assault. Not only had Texas territory been compromised through establishment of the neutral agreement, ground agreement in 1806, but the United States continued to claim the Rio Grande as the true boundary of the Louisiana Purchase. Also, various foreign agents had penetrated the province before his arrival. One of these, the Blue 
Zebulun Montgomery Pike had succeeded in crossing in Southern Plains to arrive in New Mexico in early 1807. Treated well by the Spaniards, he collected considerable information on the state of Spanish defenses of on the northern frontier, including conditions in Texas, through which he passed on his returns to Louisiana a year later. Another foreign adventurer, the Napoleonic agent Octav Octaviano de Alvimar, crossed from Louisiana into Texas with instructions to sow insurrection in New Spain. Captured by Texas troops, he was brought before Governor Cadero, who shipped him off to the interior before he could cause much harm to Spanish interests. The presence of runaway slaves and U.S. Army des deserters also had to t had also added ten to tensions. <clears throat> Excuse me. The aggressive moves of the United States along the border were only one concern for Salcedo, who also had to consider recent events in Spain and Mexico City. Napoleon had forced the abdiction of the Spanish Bourbon King Charles the Fourth and his son Ferdinand the Seventh, in favor of his brother Joseph Bonaparte. That move had met with resistance both in Spain and throughout the empire from Mexico City. Had come news of an abortive move by the colonial captain capitals, Criollo elite, to take over the government, an effort that had been frustrated frustrated by the powerful residents of Peninsulares. The Peninsulares replaced a pro Criollo viceroy with one of their own. Eventually, word arrived that a revolutionary Cortes parliament in Spain had declared the empire a constitutional monarchy. Traditional lines of authority were being disrupted, the legitimacy of the crown was being questioned, and misinformation and disinformation were rifle were rife. Conditions, therefore, were ripe for an Anglo-American move against Texas, and Salcedo pleaded for reinforcements and extensive economic investment in the province. His request was ground grounded in what he perceived to be essentially a problem of political economy like his predecessor. Salcedo considered the gover government responsible for existing conditions because it had failed to provide the necessary resources with which Tejanos could develop the province. The industry of these inhabitants of, is non-existent, but because neither have they had nor do they have elements for it, and one even marvels at how most of them cultivate their lands without necessary farming tools by substituting for them as best as they can. How some have built houses without artisans and how others suffer the rigorous cold and hot weather in those homes that they have made with sticks and shed roofs of straw and lastly at how in this poverty they have been able to dress themselves and their families since the province had no other port of entry than that of the Veracruz distance, more than 500 leagues. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Certainly there were some exaggeration in the governor's description of the situation, but not much. A few families at San Antonio and a few uh, at La Bahia and Nacogdoches were living above the subsistence level, enjoying the meager pro profits of the livestock trade and occasional sell of provisions to the local military or participation in contraband activities. The province's few artisans could not practice their crafts on a regular basis, but relied on subsistence agriculture to make ends meet. If not for the military payrolls, there would have been practically no business for the few legitimate mer merchants who make themselves combined a variety of economic pursuits and credit schemes to keep their doers and their families fed. Here is a picture that you may take a look at. Governor Salcedo's 
plan required money and more communication between Texas and the outside world. Of course, the commandment and commandment General Salcedo was not in position to grant of the former or allow the latter. A port at Matagorda Bay would only create increased opportunities for smuggling and illegal immigration from Louisiana. The expense of raising, equipping, and maintaining the kind of force Governor Salcedo proposed was impossible. No Texas would have to get by on what it had already had. Short of resources, his uncle would not even permit him to hire a secretary. Governor Salcedo took up the tax of reforming the frontier province in every imaginable way. He issued orders on the proper prepare, preparation and filing of legal documents, and he attempted to increase the efficiency of the mail system. He reorganized troop deployments, hoping to put soldiers lacking weapons to work on military construction projects for which no labor funds were available. Officials at La Bahia and Nagaroches were snowed under by Governor Salcedo's constant request for information and detailed instructions on just about every issue. In particular, they had to adjust the to the commandment general's change of heart regarding immigrants as the governor ordered that former Spanish subjects from Louisiana were to be received openly and warmly in Texas. At Bayer, Governor Salcedo took a personal hand in bringing order to people that previous governors had considered unruly and untrustworthy. He issued ordinances on every from everything from the licensing of midwives to the licensing of ox carts in effect the first vehicle registration law in Texas history. He restructured local government and organized the countryside into police jurisdictions. He established a curfew in instituted a noise ordinance and required owners to keep their properties clean and well maintained. Unfortunately for Manuel Soceto and the other representatives of the Spanish monarchy, these last efforts to enlighten government could not hold back the tide of rebellion at, that began to sweep New Spain toward independence. Insurrection on the frontier. The urgency of Governor Salcedo's appeals to the loyalty and patriotism of the Tejanos intensified as rebellion broke out in the central parts of the vice royalty at the beginning of the 19th century. New Spain was rife with the social and economic contradictions that have often made for revolution a tiny percentage of the population lived in opulence in Mexico City. Guadalajara and a handful of other urban, major urban centers, whereas the overwhelming majority of colonial Mexicans lived in abject poverty, although the silver mines of the col colony remained the driving engine of the economy, most people relied on subsistence agriculture for a living in a very small manufacturing sector consisting mostly of second-class textiles and ceramics, as well as on the large agricultural estates. Abusive labor practices predominated. The causes of the Mexican War of Independence. Spanish colonial institutions were ant antiquated and corrupt. The church represented the large and largest and richest property owner in the colony, recipient to the tithe, of the tithe that a government collected for it and beneficiary of innumerable bequests, the church consequently served as the colony's principal landlord and lender. Yet in the countryside, many parish priests lived poor, hand-to-mouth existence that led to become dis disaffected. Exploitation of the rural Indian and Custis mixed-blood population also came at the hands of an underpaid and their therefore extremely corrupt local officialdom. Bourbon reform efforts ultimately failed to solve any of these problems as they only replaced one group of corrupt petty officials with another. Although the intendants to the, the regional administrative heads who exercised considerable economic and political power were themselves well-educated and well-paid, 
Their local subordinates, known as the sub subdelegates, were not, and they came to rely on graft and extortion to make a living. Compounding these problems, which to one degree or another were endemic to most policies, poli most politities of the time, was the complex and oppressive ethnic ordering of the society inherent in the Sistema de Costas. Spanish colonial society, which consisted of about six million people at the turn of the century, was divided into two large groups, the Republica de Indios and the Republica de Españoles, with separate codes of law governing each. Mexico's 3.5 million Indians remained perpetual wards of the crown with the with a protective legal structure governing their economic and political dealings. The overwhelming majority lived in ancestral village villages, spoke with their native languages, and practiced syncretic forms of Catholicism. Local representatives of the crown took advantage of their authority over the Indians to exploit their labor and monopolize business dealings with them. The rest of the population, about 15,000 peninsulars, 1 million Criollos, and 1.5 million Castas, the Republica de Españolas was governed by a legal code that operated on the assumption that all men were not created equal. Punishment for criminal offenses was based on ethnicity. Spaniards often received fines, whereas the Castas were subject to corporal punishment of varying degrees. The legal distinctions among the various social groups extended the opportunities for advancement in both the public and private sectors. The late Bourbon push to entrust positions of higher authority, such as intendente, bishop, and high court judge to gachupines, a derogatory term for European Spaniards, traveled the considerable um, number of well-educated Criollos who saw their pers prospects limited. Although Criollos made up the overwhelming number of Hacienda and mine owners and occupied the vast majority of local government of Hacienda and mine... Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Occupied the vast majority of local government posts. They did not run the vice royalty. Although blacks, mulatos, and mestizos made up the bulk of the non-Indian population, they were denied full opportunities for personal advancement. At the same time the, that the crown and its advisors were consolidating power and in modernizing the empire in Madrid, they were ignoring the needs of and wishes of their colonial subjects in America. Meanwhile, Criollos were developing a sense of nationalism. American-born Spaniards began to resent the superior attitude and privileged status of Guachupinos and advocated a new relationship to Mother Spain. Criollo intellectuals began to feel pride in their early civilizations and to regard their accomplishments as no less worthy than those of ancient European societies. They challenged the idea that the New World environment was intrinsically inferior to that of the old world. The American provinces were no different from, and certainly not inferior to, the European possessions of the crown, and the American col colonies should be governed by Americans. Added to this long-simmering disaffection, ec economic and political upheavals, in the first decades of the 19th century, precipitated insurrection first often cut from its American possession by enemies during the course of the Napoleonic Wars, 1792 to 1815. Spain's normal commerce was disrupted. European and American imports flooded colonial markets, disrupting domestic manufacturing, second in 1804. Desperate for revenues with which to fund its war effort, the crown confiscated church assets, eliminating the single largest source of available capital in the Viceroyalty. Third drought, late in the decade, produced famine and widespread rural unemployment, especially in the Bajio, the colony's most productive economic region. 
to these troubles was added to the political instability that began in 1808 with Napoleon's usurpation of the Spanish throne. Having entered Spain under the pretense of marching against Britain's ally, Portugal, Napoleon took the opportunity to force the abdication of King Charles IV, transferring the Spanish crown to his brother, Joseph Bonaparte. The Spanish people rose in revolt against the French invaders, launching what is known as the War of Spanish Independence. Spain's American colonies also rejected the usurper Joseph Bonaparte, claiming to be royal to the legitimate heir, Ferdinand. When a meeting of Mexico City's Criollo elite declared that New Spain should be governed by Junta Provisional Council until the monarchy was restored, and the sitting viceroy agreed, panicked peninsulars carried out a coup and placed one of their own viceroys on the throne. The struggle begins. In the atmosphere of political and economic turmoil, groups of discontented Criollos and Mestizos began to conspire to overthrow the government. One such group centered the Cortero, a major agriculture, agricultural center in the Bajio, included the man who would come to be known as the father of Mexican independence, Miguel Hidalgo y Castillo. Parish priest of the small agricultural town of Dolores Hidalgo, along with the lower rank military and political officials who made up the conspiracy of was Criollo of rather a liberal bent and broad interest. The conspirators had read the writings of French Enlightenment thinkers and were informed about the political thought behind American constitutionalism. They did not entirely reject their ties to Spain. Indeed, Hidalgo never declared the outright independence of Mexico from the mother country. But the conspirators did not believe that Mexico should be governed by Mexicans rather than peninsulars. Unlike the majority of their fellow Criollos, whose fear of the masses kept them a lot allied to the Guachupines, the conspirators were willing to gamble on their ability to control the Indians and Castus, who would bear the burden of fighting. In the early morning hours of September 16, 1810, the bells of his church signaled the town, two townspeople and nearby peasants that something was wrong. Hidalgo stepped out of, on the front steps of his church and made an impassioned speech to, be, to the gathering crowd. He said to have ended it by uttering his famous grito, Long live religion, long lived our blessed mother Guadalupe, long live Fernand VII, and death to the bad government. News of the revolt made its way northward within days where at first there seemed to be little support for expanding the insurrection. The North did not have large numbers of disgruntled and hungry Indians had, and had only a few peninsulars to, so discontent in the re region appeared to be under control. However, the same class of dissatisfied Dis disaffected Criollos and Castus that existed in the more central portions of the colony also existed in the northeastern provinces. In addition, the large frontier of large number of frontier troops, overwhelmingly locals serving either in the frontier presidio companies or in militia units, had conflicted loyalties unlike regular army troops. These men had been recruited from the frontier population to serve as sort of a, a sort of home guard. They were accustomed to fighting Indians to protect their homes. How would they respond to their Spanish op officers' efforts to employ them against insurgents? The answer to that question was alarming to royal authorities, as they discovered in December of 1810, the military units in Nueve Santander revolted against the royalist government when told to prepare to march on the rebels. 
farther east, I'm sorry, farther south. Early in January, the entire command of the well-liked but royalist Antonio Cordero defected when confronted by a rebel force of 7,000 to 8,000 when insurgent envoys arrived in Nuevo Leon. Soon after that province, to uh, allied itself with the insurrection of the northeastern interior provinces. Only Texas remained loyal under remained loyal under royal control. Here is the father of Miguel Hidalgo. Texas joins the revolt. In Texas, Governor Salcedo Salcedo desperately attempted to retain the loyalty of the inhabitants of province. Arrests of suspects, instigators, both Tejanos and outsiders. Speeches on the need for loyalty to king and god and assurances of the safety of the population from Indian attacks did little to quell a growing unrest from the Nachachotes. American agents reported to the U.S. government that substantial numbers of Tejanos, including members of leading San Antonio families, were preparing to overthrow the Royalist authorities. The troops st stationed at Bexar were uneasy about the possibility of being marched south to confront the insurgents in the process, leaving their families exposed to Indian attack. This unease only increased with news of the revolts spread through neighboring provinces. Texas, however, was awash in disaffection. Some Tejanos were upset with the crown's lack of responsiveness to the needs of the province. For all of Governor Salcedo's efforts, there were few signs that were, excuse me, that the necessary investment in money and people were coming to anytime soon. At San Antonio, there where the reforms of Governor Corderos and Salcedo had most affected traditional patterns of leadership, there was resentment. There was also resentment among those who, whose economic interest had been hurt by the military's efforts to curtail contraband. Even more critical was the anxiety that Salcedo had created among the troops when he announced that the entire garrison of San Antonio might have to march south against the insurgents. The man who led the Texas revolt against Spanish rule, Juan Batista de las Casas, was himself a retired Criolla militia officer. He later claimed he was a royal subject of Ferdinand VII and that his role purpose in disposing, deposing Governor Salcedo had been to prevent the province from fa falling into anarchy, but his actions indicated otherwise. Although his motives may never be known, much weighed against him the participation of a number of Hidalgo sympathizers and disgruntled citizens of San Antonio in his coup. His constant communications with the insurgency's leadership in the interior of Mexico and his orders for the arrest of all good Chupanis in the province as well as anyone who did not recognize him as governor. The Casas revolt took place in, on January 21st, 1811, was on shaky ground almost from the very beginning. However, many among the province's leading families had stayed in the, on the sidelines, unwilling to risk alienating a government that, although it might not be a res as responsive as they wanted, still paid for the defense of Texas against enemy Indians. News of Hidalgo's defeat of Guadalajara on January 17th and the flight of the ins yeah, flight of the insurgent leadership toward the frontier contributed to, to the sense of unease among prominent Tejanos. Casas' own arbitrary rule antagonized members of San Antonio's elite families who rallied instead around Father Juan Manuel Zambrano, a native of Bexar, with the aspiration of his own. 
On March 17th, not three months after his assumption of power, Cassius was overthrown by Zambrano and his supporters. Most of his followers quickly switched allegiance and royalist officials throughout the province soon took up their posts again. Restored to the governorship, Manuel Sacero now governed a province that was very different from the one he had lost in the previous January. The Comanches and the Nortanos resumed a large-scale raiding, dissatisfied that Spanish officials no longer had the gifts and merchandise that had been the basis of the peace that had existed for a quarter century. Salcedo considered that 1,136 men who formed the province's military defense largely untrustworthy. They had already mutinied once, and they continued to be exposed to the revolutionary rhetoric of disloyal kinsmen and ever-present foreigners. Everyday shortages mounted. Paper, clothing, candles, even horses were all in short supply. But most troubling of all were reports filtering in from Louisiana of preparations for, for an invasion of Texas by force of insurgents and Anglo-American mercenaries. Rebellion turns into struggle for independence. The reports were not rumors. Mexican insurgents had fled to the United States at the time of Hidalgo, Hidalgo's debacle and were attempting to enlist U.S. support for their cause. In the aftermath, the royalist capture and execution of Hidalgo on March 21, 1811, leadership of the war against Spanish rule devolved upon another cleric, Father Jose Maria Morales. A mestizo whose more realistic grasp of the situation and better organizational skills brought him considerable initial success. Under the, his leadership, a revolutionary Congress finally declared independence from Spain, abolished slavery, and drafted a constitution for Mexico. On the frontier, Jose Bernardo Guterres de Lara took up the cause of independence. He was a criollo and a native frontiersman. He had been born in the Rio Grande Valley, town of Rivera, now Guerra via Tamal Tamalapis. In 1774, the son of a pioneer settlers in Escandon, Escandon's colony. By 1810, he was a family man, a petty merchant, blacksmith, and like many other many settlers of the area, a landowner. He was also dissatisfied. Or also disaffected. When the Hidalgo revolt erupted, he immediately embraced the cause. As a result, he played a prominent role in helping the insurgents achieve early success in Nuevo Santander. The defeat of the rebellion in the early months of 1811 did not discourage Guterres de Lara. Claiming to have been assigned to seek assistance in the United States, he traveled to Washington, D.C., in July, although he failed to obtain overt assistance from the U.S. administration, Gutierrez de Lora received ta tactic approval for his plans. Back in Louisiana, by the spring of 1812, he met with local authorities and began recruiting what eventually became the Republican Army of the North. His most important collaborator in organizing the invasion of invasion was a U.S. Army officer, Augustus Magui. The West Point graduate reassigned his commission to take up military leadership of the Anglo-American volunteers in the Army, which came to consist of about equal numbers of Anglo-Americans -American, and Mexicans. In the meantime, Governor Salcedo had been restored to power and was attempting to implement political reforms coming from Spain. In their resistance to Napoleon, Spaniards had set up a Cortes, a parliament to le legislate and regency to govern in the name of Ferdinand. The Bourbon heir to the throne, the Cortes meeting in Cadiz, called for a constitutional convention with representatives from throughout the empire. The product of the convention's work, the Constitution of 1812, was a liberal document that created equality among all citizens of the empire, established a constitutional monarchy and divided the empire into provinces, each of which 
was to be represented by a le legislative body called the Provincial Deputation. It proved impossible for Texas to find someone competent and wealthy enough to serve as its representatives to the Cortez and so relied on the representation representative of Cohia. When in June 1814, the provincial Dep deputation was formed for the eastern interior provinces of which Texas was part, the unsettled situation in the province was also, also prevented it from sending a delegate to Monterey. The experiment was short-lived, however, as once assu he assumed the throne, Ferdinand abolished the constitution and dismissed the provincial de deputations. Although they existed only for a few months, the provincial deputation had established a precedent for Republican government in Spanish America. In August 1812, the Gutierrez de Lora led expedition crossed the Sabine River. It is doubtful Gutierrez de Lora was aware of or interested in the turn of events in Spain. The expedition arrived at Nacogdoches to find the local troops unwilling to fight in September. Now grown to 300 effectives, the Republican Army of the North took Santisima, Trinidad de Salcedo, discovering that the governor Salcedo had marched to the Guadalupe River to obstruct their advance on Baker. Gutierrez de Lora and Magi turned southeast to La Bella, where they occupied the Presidio in early November. Between November 1812 and February 1813, the royalists besieged La Bihia, but were unable to dislodge the insurgents who finally went after Salcedo's army as it retreated to Bejar. The royalists made one last stand about nine miles southeast of San Antonio on March 29th at the Battle of Rocio. About 1,200 men under C Colonel S Simon Herrera met the approximately 800 men Republican Army of the North. Having lost hundreds of men, more than a thousand horses of all, all of his field artillery and most other equipment, Salcedo had no choice but to surrender. On April 1st, 1813, the Republican Army of the North, under the command of Gutierrez de Lora and Samuel Kemper, Maggi's successor took San Antonio. The first independence of Texas. The process of the nation building began with bloodshed on the evening of April 3rd. Salcedo and his subordinates, a total of 14 Guachupanis, were assassinated a few miles outside of Bexar as they were being escorted out of the province. Kemper and a number of other Anglo-Americans were outraged by the brutal action a declaration of independence adopted on April 6, and a constitution that the Mexican insurgents drew up in the following days completed the alienation of many Anglo officers who took their leave and returned to Louisiana. According to the constitution, the state of Texas, as part of an independent Mexico, was to be governed by, pres by a president protector whose power would be shared only with the junta of five men that enjoyed a merely adv adversary role. Catholicism remained the established re religion, if anything served to per partially appease some of the Anglo-American participants. It was the constitutional provision for land grants of approximately 4,500 acres to each volunteer. In short order, factionalism, factionalism, overwhelmed the Republicans, Gutierrez de Lora and his supporters, mostly Mexican insurgents and sympathizers, faced off with the Anglo-American volunteers and U.S. government agency, agents who perceived Gutierrez de Lora as an arbitrary and de divisive leader. Pressing for the removal of the Gutierrez de Lora who was William Sch Schaller, a U.S. Department representative who championed Jose Alvarez de Toledo as the solution for the problem of the insurgent government. In the days following his arrival in Bexar, on August 1, 1813, Toledo and Gutierrez de Lora fought over control of the government. Indian Toledo won, and Gutierrez de Lora withdrew to Louisiana. 
By this time, it was clear that the Viceroy Kalahea was determined not to allow the murders of Salcedo and other Spaniards to go unavenged or to have Texas remain in the hands of insurgents and foreigners. The man he charged with recovering control of the Arant province was General Joaquin Arredondo, who had recently been promoted to commandment general for the eastern interior provinces. Arredondo had considerable experience fighting insurgents in the north, having served as military governor of Nuevo Santander and ha having put down the rebellion in that province in 1812 with the, an army of over 1,800 men. Arredondo moved north towards San Antonio in er early August for a final showdown with the Texas insurgency. Here's the, I'll get a close-up and see if you can see that. It's kind of hard to read. It's really small. And then this is the newspaper. On August 18th, 1813, Arredondo's Royalist Army fought Toledo's 1,400-men Republican Army of the North a few miles south of the Medina River near the Laredo San Antonio Road. The day long battle of Medina was a complete disaster for Toledo's army of Mexicans, Anglo Americans, and Indians. In Colonial, or I'm sorry, Colonel Ignacio Elizondo, the man who had captured Hidalgo, was now turned loose on the fleeing insurgents. With a 200 man force, he pushed pursued what remained of the Republican Army of the North northward and by September had reached the Nagadoches. He reported having executed 71 rebels and taken over 100 people captive, mostly women and children. Arredondo, meanwhile, had executed hundreds more and imposed martial law in San Antonio. He began his final and rather inflated report. Imp Imposed martial law in San Antonio. Um, report on the campaign. The ever victorious and invincible arms of the sovereign, aided by the powerful hand of the god of war, have gained the most complete and decisive victory over the base and perfi perfidious rabble commanded by certain vile assassins, ridiculously styled a general and commander's. Texas was again in the royalist fold. Meanwhile, in Mexico, Father Morales had taken over his over as the leader of the independence movement. A better military tac tactician than Hidalgo, he managed to establish control over a considerable portion of the country south of Mexico City and organize a Congress that formally declared Mexico's independence from Spain. Unfortunately, he proved unable to convince enough Criollos to back the cause. In November 1815, Father Morales was captured and executed. By that time, Texas had experienced a second failed insurrection and was teetering on the brink of utter devastation. A howling wilderness, wilderness that last years of Spanish Texas the Spanish Texas in the fall of 1813 was a land devoid of hope. From across the border in western Louisiana, Juan Martin Veramundi, Francesco Orochi, Vicente Trevisi, Trevisio, and Francesco Ruiz, all Tejanos who had participated as local leaders in Gutierrez de Lora's Republican experiment, heard the news that they were not included in the general amnesty granted to contrite rebels. Yet others, such as Erasmo Sequin, were caught between loyalties. The one-time Bexer postmaster and leading member of the Zambra Zambrano's revolt against Casas had been accused of providing letters of introduction for insur insurgents, for which crime all of his poverty property had been confiscated. It took years for him to clear his name. Some unpre 
unrepent unrepentant Tejano insurgents continued to work actively against Spanish rule. One such rebel was Vicente Turin, a former officer in the Alamo Company who had joined the Gutierrez Meji expedition. He organized a small company of like minded men and roamed throughout the northern Texas, bartering with the Indians and inciting them against Spaniards. For the general population, Texas, even those who had remained steadfastly in the royalist camp at the abandonment of crops, the sequestration of property, impressment into military or other public service, and the consent, constant menace of Indian attack meant a precarious existence. Indian Texas. Even as the insurgents and royalists struggled for control of San Antonio, San Antonio and the other Tejano settlements of Texas remained very much an Indian country. Despite the general peace established in the first years of the 19th century, young Lipan Comanche and Wichita warriors occasionally raided Tejano horse herds or committed thefts in outlying ranches. Tejanos retaliated, sometimes indiscriminately, leading to the death of unrelated Indians. Early in the decade, the Comanches also suspected a renewed Spanish Lipan alliance with rumors circulating that Spanish troops had assisted in Lipan raid um, on a Comanche encampment. At the same time, the various Wichita tribes were divided between those closer to the Americans who favored the United States because of the higher quality and cheaper goods of the North American provided and those closer to Spanish settlements who advocated continuing the Spanish alliance. Only concerted di diplomatic efforts between 1804 and 1806, including a reinforcement of trade, contacts, and gifts by governors Eliquizabo and Cordero on the Spanish side of Lepon chiefs Canasso and Morongo, Katsoteca, Comanche leaders Chihuahua and Yazat and Ta Tawakani, Wichita chiefs, Kiscott and Dagarskira, sorry if I mispronounced, Daga, Dagarskira kept the peace structure in place. A separate agreement in 1805 between Chief Cor Carantas Coronitos of the Tonko. Tonka was, and Governor Cordero broke down almost immediately. As the Spaniards were unable to supply the goods promised in the agreement, and the Tonka was resumed their raids against Spanish herds. In effect, these tribes, with direct access to American goods, adopted a similar strategy to that of the Cados during much of the 18th century of playing Spaniards off Frenchmen. The Cadacho chief de Dahuet, who had assumed de facto leadership of the regions, remaining Cados, clearly expressed this attitude when he confronted a Spanish official who threatened to confiscate any American goods. The Cadachos brought back to the Texas from the Nachochotes on the Camino Real. The road de Hawait claimed had always been theirs, and if the Spanish prevented them from using it as their ancestors had always done, he would may soon make it a bloody road. The Cados and Wichita's were encouraged in the aggressive attitude toward the Spaniards by John Sibley, Thomas Jefferson's Indian agent on the Louisiana-Texas frontier. Part of Sibley's job, it was to line up as many Indian tribes in the region of, on the American side for the coming way that many of in the American administration and the Spanish government felt was inevitable as a result of the dispute over the boundary of the Louisiana Purchase. Although war did not come, Americans continued to penetrate ever westward, giving the region's Indians increasingly less incentive to work with the Spaniards. For instance, in summer of 1808, Anthony Glass led a group of American Indian traders to the Wichita and Comanche settlements on the Red River region, which Spanish officials were informed about 
but were unwilling to stop for fear of antagonizing tr the tribes. The outbreak of the Mexican War of Independence, which spelled the end of Spanish Indian trade, let alone gifts, further eroded Indian ties to the Spaniards. Although most tribes, both indigenous and migrant, stayed out of the escalating Mexican rebellion against Spanish rule, in the early stages, once Lipin, Lipin's Tonka, Tonkawas and most anti-Spanish Wichita's perceived that the Republican Army of the North had gained the upper hand in the Texas insurgency, they threw in their lot with the rebel, with the rebels, Lipins under Chief Cuegos de Castro, and other Indian auxiliaries participated in the Battle of Rocio, as a result of which the Republican forced Governor Salcedo to surrender. By the time the battle of the Battle of Medina, approximately 100 Indians, including Lipins, Wichita's, and Tonkawas, were part of the Republican force. Their commitment to the insurgents was not deep. However, and they abandoned the field shortly after the battle began, the Indians did not entirely escape Arredondo's wrath. He sent a small force as far as, far as Nagadoches to attack and an encampment of suspected Lipan rebel sympathizers. Between the Battle of Medina and Mexican independence, eight years later, the Indians of Texas became dependent on American trade goods. Looking to Spanish Texas and the Rio Grande country for the horses and mules that increasingly formed the basis of exchange. In addition, cap captive taking increased, particularly among the Comanches, who had suffered declines as a result of epidemics and a drought that had reduced the number of buffalo on the southern plains. The reversals, in fact, led to the disappearance of the Cotzotecas and Yamparica tribal divisions and the emergence of the Peniteca Comanches, just as changes among Wichita's, the Wichita's led to the emergence of new Tawakoni tribe named Waco, whose large principal town was located at the site of the present-day downtown Waco. Divisions among the Lipans resulted in Chief El Cojosa's band of Lipans striking a separate peace with Comanches and Wichita, which meant that San Antonio, La Bahia, and Spanish settlements below the Rio Grande often faced joint raids by members of all three tribes. In general, the smaller tribal group groups and migrant Indians proved friendlier to the Spaniards, Biloxis, Alabamas, and Coshatas, for instance, had come to Texas fleeing American settlers, and although they had no choice but to trade with Americans, they appreciated the hands-off approach of the Spanish government. As long as Spain maintained it to, to its title to Texas, they would be safe from further displacement by land-hungry American frontiersmen. Consequently, although they did not directly involve themselves in Spanish affairs, they did keep royal officials informed of foreign activities in the southwest Texas or southeast Texas area, where they built their villages. Moreover, while they reached agreements with the few remaining Bidaeus and Acoquias of the coastal region, they drove out the Cocos tribe of the Caranquas, making clear their intention to establish the, their hunting grounds in the area. While the Cocos were forced to move south by the migrant tribes, the other Karankawa tribes faced attack from the Lipans, Comanches, and outsiders. Skirmishes between Jean Lafitte's freebooters and Cocos on Galveston Island led to the 1817 battle, The Three Trees, in which 30 Karankawas were killed and the rest fled by across the bay, the end of an Indian presence on Galveston Island, Kuhanas and who had converted to Christianity and settled at Mission Refugio, abandoned, abandoned station the following year. After the Comanche and Lipan raids, they joined other Karankawa groups close to 
the coast where they could better defend themselves against increased attacks from enemy tribes. Shipwreck sailors along the middle Texas coast were routinely killed by the Caroncoas, not out to lo of loyalty to the Spaniards, but in the defense of their own territory. Here is the close-up picture. Pirates and insurgents. By the time Antonio Martinez arrived in Texas to take over the to take over the governor. Actually, I am going to pause here and I will come back for chapter four, part three. Thank you.